when a guard would stop and talk to you, you used to stand back and you would yell so people could hear what you were saying to that guard as they walked by or, or within the vicinity. But he knew what a convict was going to do before they thought of it themselves. themselves. he just been around that long and uh, he was tough. They'd find uh, Sparky in about every conceivable place you could imagine, which we would, of course, dump. They'd wait until everybody was locked up, and he would open his door, run down to cell one, and get a bugler can full of Sparky and take it back to his cell. She had a kind of a hypnotic power. There were a great many wild cats around the penitentiary, and most people couldn't get near them. But she would stand in the doorway of the cell house and say, Kitty, 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 and those cats would go to her. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another edition of Stool Pigeon Saturday. Today we have Haley Noble in the studio with us. She is one of our resident researchers, and she has done a lot of work on all of our inmates who were involved in uh, all the wars. And so she is here to give us some awesome insights on some of our uh, our inmates who served uh, in World War One, World War Two, have you done any besides the two World Wars? Have you done like Korea, Vietnam? No, mostly just yeah. World War Two. Not yet. The most. Your... Yeah, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Because um, you also did this yeah. World War One exhibit out here in the Earl, correct? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. She just finished her master's at Boise State, and we Woo-hoo. are excited to have her both here at the Pen and here in the studio with us. So. Yeah. Thanks for having me, guys. It's of course. Very exciting. <laughs> All right, well, who who would you like to talk about first today? Well, the first inmate we're going to talk about is Rufus Roy Liggins. And he served in World War II before coming to the prison uh, in 1950. And so he's a little interesting because he is one of the inmates that actually died here at the prison. He's buried in the cemetery. So we've got just some... Um, info about his service from what I was able to find and then we do know a little bit about his time here at the pen. So Liggins enlisted in the army in Phoenix, Arizona. He was already 44 years old. A little uh, older than you generally see. He started his duty there on uh, August 28, 1942. He was relatively short-lived in the army just because we have the date of his separation being in march of 1943 so he was only on active duty for a few months Mm -hmm. and do you think that had to do with his age it might have i couldn't really find much information about uh, his time in the service actually so officially he was honorably discharged in april of 1944 Mm -hmm. But from the time of his enlistment in August of 42 to his separation in March of 1943, we know that he was at various uh, bases here within the United States. Mm -hmm. So that was a little uh, interesting because we have his military service paperwork in his inmate file. And so going through that, he mentions that he did serve overseas, but... That was a little misleading because I don't know that he actually left the United States. According to the unit he was in, he was part of the 55th Troop Carrier Squadron, which was part of the larger 375th Troop Carrier Group. And at that time, they were stationed in Kentucky and Missouri. And then at the time of his separation, they would have been in North Carolina. So they didn't actually deploy to the Pacific Theater until the summer of 1943, which would have been after his separation. So I don't know that he actually did go overseas. That unit was part of the airborne assault of NADZAB in New Guinea, which was a fairly big operation. And we know that then they were part of the occupational force in Japan, But, uh, you know, I don't actually know what he did during those few months he was in the service because from all that I've been able to find with the dates and the locations, he didn't actually go to New Guinea Mm. or the Pacific. 
So why do you think he would say that he did serve overseas just to make himself look better? You know, I'm not sure. That's one of those mysteries we have where, you know, you have these conflicting pieces of evidence and, you know, it's his word versus the official unit histories. And so it's just one of those things. I mean, maybe... Maybe he, yeah, he wanted to make himself look better, or maybe he th- thought that his time here in the United States warranted overseas mm. status. I, mm. I really don't know. Rufus is African American. Mm-hmm. Was his unit, was it a segregated unit? Was it just African Americans? You know, or? that's a little unclear. We okay. do know that in World War II, there were segregated units. Mm-hmm. They were usually, you know, the officers typically would have been white men who Mm. then uh, commanded these African Americans. Um, But that I'm not entirely sure since I couldn't find his specifics. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, I don't want to say for sure. Absolutely, yeah. (laughs) I'm just curious if you came across anything with that division or, yeah. Well, and so I don't actually know, like, what his job was. Mm The 55th Troop Carrier Squadron, they were responsible for transporting personnel and supplies to forward areas, especially there within the Pacific, Mm -hmm. uh, when they were deployed. So within those parameters, I really don't know what his individual job would have been, especially in the United States. I mean, you know, understandably, they would have been doing a lot of training. So I'd imagine that while they were still stationed in the U.S., they would have been undergoing a lot of training and you know, exercises yeah. and getting everybody ready to go to the Pacific. Yeah. Now, yeah. do you think he said he served overseas because North Carolina is very different than Arizona? <laughs> like, that counts as, like, overseas, where, like, you go from Arizona to North Carolina, and you're like, sorry, what is this place? <laughs> you know, I mean, that's entirely possible. Uh, yeah, because... Uh, Presumably, he was, I think I read he was born in Texas. Um, Yeah, he enlisted in Arizona. And then from there, yeah, he was stationed in Kentucky and Missouri, North Carolina, very different places. Mm -hmm. So, you know, probably a bit of a culture shock. Yeah, yeah. 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 (laughs) We know that at the time of his enlistment, he was divorced with Mm -hmm. no kids. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, So, you know, it's hard to say if maybe he had a family yeah, or yeah. like siblings or things like that that he would have lived with you know we really don't know mm-hmm. so then you know after his service he is uh, honorably discharged in california in april of 1944 from then on you know we're not really sure what he did mm-hmm. in those six years leading up to his arrest before he came here mm-hmm. we don't know But we, you know, there is evidence that a lot of service members do kind of have some trouble adjusting to civilian life. You know, maybe he could have been one of those. Although, you know, at the time, it seems like his crime that he was arrested for was relatively minor. He was arrested for issuing a check without funds. So, you know, maybe he had some money trouble. We don't know. But that's kind of what it points to, that maybe he had trouble holding a job if he mm-hmm. didn't have available funds for this check that he wrote. Yeah. So, yeah, he uh, came to the prison on November 17th, 1950 for um, those fraudulent checks. <laughs> he served about two years, and then in 1952 he was released on probation. But... Uh, he did violate those terms, so then he returned back in 1954. Mm. Um, and from there, we know that he served here at the prison. Yeah, he received a five-year sentence. Um, in November of 1955, um, we do know that he suffered a stroke, and that's ultimately what led to his death. Mm. Uh, three months later, so he died February 19th, 1956. He was 58. So, wow, that's young. Yeah. yeah, relatively young. Yeah. Um, and nobody claimed his body, so he is actually one of the inmates that is buried in the prison cemetery. And the interesting thing about him is that the local uh, veterans club, they um, saw fit to give him a military headstone. They donated the money so that he would have this proper burial. So you do see that he is one of the few intact headstones out there in the prison mm-hmm. cemetery. And it's the, the typical military headstone with the white whitish stone, has his name. Uh, we know he was 
a sergeant, mm -hmm. got his rank, and of course that uh, 55th Troop Carrier Squadron. Although I think the specific is they called it the 55th Aviation Squadron or something. Because so it was yeah. in the Air Force, right? Um, is it his or is the, the Army other one? Air Force, yeah. So, the so the Air Force isn't actually a separate branch until 1947. Gotcha. So yeah. a lot of... You know the Air Force. It's uh, not. It's not right. the actual <laughs> branch. Um, it's the so, Army Air Force. I got you. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that was included in the Army until 1947. See, this is this is good. I yeah. didn't. I know nothing <laughs> about military history, so I'm very so happy. Why, that you're why here. you have me here? Yeah. It is. It, is, <laughs> it really, really is. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. you know there were lots of wars in the years that we were. This prison was open, and mm -hmm. we. I don't. I mean, I can't speak for you, but I know nothing about any of these wars. Pretty much. Blue Literally, like most of the Air Force things I know are because of Rufus and <laughs> Ernesto Blanco, who are, is, he also has a military marker out in the prison cemetery. So other than that, I am not very, uh, <laughs> it's good Haley's on staff. That's yes. all I can say. Yeah. Oh, well, thanks, guys. <laughs> we love Haley. <laughs> Every time I have a question, it's like, Haley, will you research this person? Because I don't understand this. What is what is a branch of this thing? There you go. Uh, well, and of course, you know that's 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 my bread and butter. So right, I am yeah. like totally mm -hmm. happy to so nice. to research all of that good stuff. Yeah, I love it. Um, so yeah, that's Rufus Liggins. A really sad story here that mm -hmm. he had a stroke, died at the prison. So do you know if he had any family? Is that is they, can they not get in contact with them? Did he just not have any? Is that why he wasn't his body? He wasn't claimed you know that's a little unclear since he was a little older i don't know the status of like his parents if they yeah. would have still been alive like i said on his enlistment papers it said he didn't have kids but that he was divorced right. so i mean i'm not sure if he remarried mm. or yeah. would have had some siblings or things mm -hmm. like that um it's a little unclear why his body wasn't claimed yeah. um but i just i think it's really you know kind of cool that the local veterans here saw fit to mm -hmm. to pull their money, give yeah. him this headstone with the full yeah. military honors and all of that good stuff. I I know when he committed his crime that he basically said that his sister was supposed to put money on his books. Oh, yeah. oh, and so yeah. you know when he passed this this check, he said, you know, I thought I had the money in there. It was like I know that's in his intake, but I've never seen if he if he did have if his sister was still around to accept right. his body after his death you know so and being african-american in idaho mm -hmm. in 1950 mm -hmm. you know he and being obviously poor he didn't have this money in mm -hmm. the first place like mm -hmm. he probably does not have any sort of privilege and most of the men that are buried out in the cemetery are there because their family couldn't afford to have them you know they are there are the creeps the guys who committed crimes that their family didn't want their bodies but right, right. a lot of them they were just simply just so poor that mm -hmm. their body couldn't be transported to an external cemetery and, and given proper burial. Yeah. So. Now, do you know how he yeah. ended up in Idaho? Because you said he was yeah. discharged in California, right? Yeah. yeah, that's a bit of a mystery as well. Mm -hmm. um, so we have these gaps where we know, you know like, we know he was in Arizona yeah. in 1942. We know that he was in California in 1944. Mm -hmm. But until he's arrested in Idaho um, in 1950, you know, there's not a clear yeah. path mm -hmm. um, to why he would have been here. Um, that sense which comes is out next it's, year. it's one of those <laughs> mysteries, you know, here at the prison where where we mm -hmm. run into these gaps yeah. mm -hmm. and they're so hard to fill. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And um, where in Idaho was he arrested? Blackfoot, I believe. Oh, okay. um, <laughs> he wrote that check uh, there at the Albertsons in Blackfoot, mm -hmm. and so you know, taken in the jail there, transferred here. Yeah, and just one of those unfortunate stories. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, here's another question. My dad asked me this because he seemed like weirdly outraged um, when when I told him that there were military headstones. So when they are in the military and they commit a crime, are they still considered, like, does the, the army basically still claim them? Or because they're technically criminals now, are, do they, like, drop them from, like, honorable someone who's like honorably served you know what yeah, i mean like cause he was like status. i thought that he when they came that. into prison they like because i told him that rufus had a had a headstone and he was like i thought that when they came into prison that like the army didn't want to claim them anymore mm -hmm. so like i'm really surprised that he has a headstone that's like an official one you know that i again it's a, a little unclear and i think it varies especially from person to person mm -hmm. 
And I would think it would depend on the crime. Yeah. Where, you know, Rufus, this was a, a relatively minor thing. Yeah, no, no, um, crime. You know, and it's hard to say because you, you have these things like, like especially within the Marine Corps where they're very hardcore, where it's like once a Marine, always a Marine. Mm-hmm. Right. Like, yeah. and that's just part of your identity. Yeah, uh, long story short, I don't know. <laughs> but I, I believe it's, a, you know, kind of a case-by-case case basis. Okay. Yeah. And, like, he was honorably discharged. Right. And that I believe that makes quite a difference. Yeah. Whereas, you know, if you commit your crime while you're still mm-hmm. in the Army, yeah. you know, you'd be subject to court-martial right. and maybe dishonorably discharged. Right. And, you know, all of that makes a difference mm-hmm. as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Interesting, yeah. I wonder the proximity to World War II, since he died so soon after... I was just thinking, like, the proximity. Maybe people still felt that patriotic support because he is a veteran. He died well, in prison. Well, and also they're, and in, no family. they're in Korea, the midst of Korea, the Korean War in mm-hmm. '56, right? right? Yeah. And, and so there is sort of a, you know, definitely yeah. a, a patriot patriotism mm-hmm. surge. Yeah. And Ernesto Blanco served in Korea, and that's, mm. that's stated on his headstone as well. You know, it really depends, too, on the war because I feel mm. like Korea was so you know, kind of hushed up, not talked about. Mm -hmm. Vietnam was, you know, there was so much conflict Mm -hmm. socially Mm -hmm. around that kind of things. Mm -hmm. But where you have like World War II, which was a really uniting force within Mm -hmm. the country, Mm -hmm. you see that a lot of that patriotism is still there for years after the war. Mm -hmm. And so I think that makes a big difference as well, especially here in Idaho, where I would, you know, hazard a guess that it's one of the most patriotic places. I think I read recently uh, like a headline that Idaho was one of the top most patriotic states really? in the country. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I'm, <laughs> huh. I'm not making it okay. up. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm <laughs> so I mean maybe in the 50s it would have been a different story but mm-hmm. but you know there's there's much more of this uniting force behind World War II rather than mm-hmm. some of these later conflicts. Yeah. Please like and follow our Facebook page, Old Idaho Penitentiary. From there, you can connect with us directly by joining the Behind Gray Walls podcast group, where you can find the mugshots of the inmates featured in today's episode, supplementary images of the penitentiary, and discussions between group members. We'd love to see you there. So part two of the part two. first stool pigeon with Haley. <laughs> so the next thing I'm going to talk about is just kind of the prison in general during World War II. So basically what was going on here during that time is we have Gowan Field, which was an Army Air Force base that was built in 1941. And that's out here in the Boise area, right? Yes. Yes, that is by the airport that was part of Boise. And then you have the Mountain Home Air Base, which was built in 1942. So you have both of these big military stations, and of course, everybody needs to do laundry. So basically, the Boise laundries here were just getting overwhelmed, and the the volume was just way too much. So that's when it was kind of proposed, you know, that maybe the prison, if there was assistance in help buying the laundry equipment Mm -hmm. that maybe the prisoners could do the laundry instead and kind of relieve the laundries, um, you know, the independent ones here in Boise. And so by they're overwhelmed by like the soldiers laundry, like are they, the air force base is sending their laundry out to just like everyday laundromats. Is that what's going on? Okay. Okay. And yes. that's probably expensive, right? Oh, totally. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, so. I mean, the laundromat people are into it, though. Yeah. Right. <laughs> everyone else is like, yeah. I really just need to do my whites. Right. And yeah. here you've got this big like, long the entire line. laundromat's just like taken up with like khakis, and you're just like, hmm, this is a bummer. Yeah. So uh, it was uh, proposed that, you know, the prison kind of undertake all of this. And so they got assistance buying the equipment, and it was turned out to be a big success for the prison. Mm -hmm. They were able to buy the equipment and do both of these laundry loads for these air bases, the Army air bases. And so the prison, it would employ 40 inmates at a time, and they would actually be rotated. So it wasn't always the same people working all the time Mm -hmm. because it it paid pretty well. They they got $10 a month. So it was rotated, you know, Mm -hmm. to kind of make it as fair as possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was a good thing for the prison because it ultimately brought in a lot of money mm-hmm. that, uh, you know, the Army paid 
paid the prison for their work. Mm -hmm. The the inmates got paid as well. So it was just one of those big success work programs Mm -hmm. here at the prison site. So it started in 1943, and then it ultimately ended in 1945 when the war was over. Mm -hmm. So, you know, not necessarily long running, but just kind of a, a short little program that's a little interesting that maybe people don't know. Yeah, so I have, let's see, a a newspaper article from the Statesman from September 1944. And yeah, it says that that approximately 2 million pieces of laundry have gone through the prison laundry rooms in a year's time. Wow. That's a lot of laundry. Yes. 2 million? And so that was what was like in private laundromats. Yeah. Clothes. Wow. Mm -hmm. So, so it was a big undertaking. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, um, the article also references that, you know, they were given this $10 a month credited to them, and that many of the men then used some of that money to buy war bonds. Mm-hmm. So you can oh, see okay. it's kind of full circle Cyclical. that, you know, these men, they really did want to do their patriotic duty, whether that was doing the laundry or, you know, donating their money to buy these war bonds. Wow. Yeah, that's really cool because you would think as a prisoner you'd want to save that money to get out. Yeah, mm-hmm. or but just for commissary every yeah. week. You know, yeah, you pay for extra cigarettes and mm-hmm. candy well, bars. And, and, yeah, and we great. see that that's actually kind of a common thing. When I was doing my World War One research, I saw the same thing that inmates mm-hmm. would donate money to the Red Cross. They would buy war bonds. So you know, we kind of think of prison as often isolated mm-hmm. from society and all the things that are going on, but we see that that's not a, always the case, that they were actively participating in these patriotic campaigns. Mm-hmm. I was curious if if it if you looked into, you know, Korea or any other wartime, if... N- no, it's yeah. generally not referenced. Okay. I mean, I, I saw this because there's just like a small, tiny snippet mm-hmm. in the warden's report yeah. for mm-hmm. that. I mean, I haven't specifically looked during Korea and the start of Vietnam, so that would be something to look into. Yeah. But I wonder if For they sure. would, though, because, like, we've been talking about this World War II was such a whole effort on, on the entire country's part, whereas I feel like once we got into Korea, it was like, mm-hmm. I don't even, did they it's sell a lot, war bonds and stuff during those? Yeah, it's very yeah, it's different. Very it's very yeah. different than World War II. So well, I wonder if that was... You know, and I think it has to do... Like you say, it's very different. You know, at least in World War II, America was attacked. Mm -hmm. Our allies, Mm -hmm. you know, we joined the allies Mm -hmm. and provided support. And, you know, the factories were going full steam. Mm -hmm. Basically, any wartime economy goods were sent overseas. Um, Whereas, you know, you get into more Korea and Vietnam, and it's the U.S. going in trying to impose on these other countries yeah. it was the spread of communism. Yeah, communism. Right. oh no that Sick. evil communism right. and so you see you know it's much more about the winning hearts and minds mm-hmm. um rather than this whole like oh we were attacked mm-hmm. we have to fight back the axis mm-hmm. whereas you know these other ones it's much more political and about resources and all of that more complicated stuff. Can you tell us anything about the conditions of the laundry, like being inside, can you? I mean, I don't have any like firsthand account Mm -hmm. information, so I don't necessarily know. I mean, now we go in and it's super creepy. And I don't like the laundry. There's something creepy about it. It's, you know, when you have a machine called the Mangler. (laughs) It's- That's true. Yeah. Yeah. It's super, so was um, it that same area? Was it bigger? I would imagine if you're doing two million you know, shirts. Is I, that same? I really don't know. And that's where these kind of records are. Mm-hmm. They're not the best. They don't necessarily have all the details that we want to know now. Right. Um, and so I have no idea if like the stuff that's in there now is the same mm-hmm. machi- machinery 40, yeah. that yeah. was that was bought in 1942. Yeah, that's a good question. Or forty three, you know, so so I I don't know. And I followed an, an inmate around, and he's like, it was hot, it was loud, it was moist in there. Oh, you just like walked like in and sweated. I mean, gross. that's exactly what I yeah. imagine is yeah. that it's you know really steamy. Mm-hmm. It's you know it's it's big pieces of machinery, so yeah. it's loud and yeah. <laughs> All wow. right, well, 
Haley, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me. This was awesome information, which I pretty much knew nothing of. So happy to be of service. Hey, nice. Uh, Nice (laughs) fun. We'll have you on again very soon. Yeah, I know. I'm excited uh, to talk about another inmate who served in World War II and about a little known piece of Idaho history that I knew nothing about. (gasps) So that'll, that'll be exciting. Yay. All right. Well, thank you. Well, And now we do. We're trying to do a segment. But since you listen to the podcast, you might get this right. So when we say, do your own number, you would say, do your own time. Nice. nice. Nailed it. <laughs> well done. All right. We'll see you next week. Cool. All right. See Have a good one. <laughs> if you enjoyed Behind Gray Walls, please rate, review, and subscribe so others can find our podcast. If you're interested in more Old Idaho Penitentiary information and to see mugshots of the inmates featured in this episode, follow the Old Idaho Penitentiary on Instagram and Facebook. If you want to learn more about the Idaho State Historical Society and its other sites, follow ID State Historical Society on Instagram or visit history.idaho.gov. If you have a question or comment for the hosts, please email us at behindgraywalls at gmail.com.